We're now moving forward to concentrate on the period following the Napoleonic Wars, the late teens, the 1820s, and the early 1830s. And the theme for this lecture is the pioneering rethinking of English landscape and its relation to European models in the work of the painter John Constable and poet John Clare. Back in 1770, Thomas Gainsborough remarked, I quote, with regard to real views from nature in this country, he, Gainsborough, has never seen any place that affords a subject equal to the poorest imitations of Gaspar or Claude. There was, however, another European landscape tradition which grew in popularity towards the end of the 18th century, and that's the Dutch and Flemish 17th century landscape paintings by Reistel, Rubens, Hobbemer, and so on. On the left, the, the Mediterranean tradition, um, typified by Salvator Rosa and Claude, and on the right, <clears throat> some of these um, low country paintings in the 17th century. The flatter landscape of the Low Countries prompted their landscape painters to focus on more textured, rougher scenery. Rutted paths, broken banks, low profile cottages, old mills, and big, big skies with rich cloud patterns. And this was scenery that in many respects matched that of England's East Anglia. And it was from East Anglia that several influential English landscape painters came in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In particular, Gainsborough, Constable, and the painters of the Norwich School, such as Cotman and Crome. It was also from the low profile, gently undulating English countryside in Northamptonshire that John Clare, the poet, drew his inspiration for championing a different kind of landscape aesthetic. Like Gainsborough, neither Constable nor Clare traveled abroad to taste Mediterranean scenery at first hand, but both knew the landscape traditions that came from there. Constable remarked, the Dutch painters were stay-at-home people, hence their originality. And in a letter of 1823, he wrote, Am I doomed never to see the living scenes which inspire the landscape of Wilson and Claude Lorraine? No, but I was born to paint a happier land, my own dear England. And we'll see later John Clare's own equally strong feelings about his native tradition in landscape painting. So it's from the more homely Northern European tradition that many of these early 19th century tastes in English scenery developed. But that initiative needed promotion and careful naturalization, especially at a time when authoritative standards of beauty and landscape, according to the Royal Academy, were largely those set by the Mediterranean painters, such as Claude and the Poussins. William Wordsworth once wrote, and this is a letter of the 21st of May, 1807. Every great and original writer, in proportion as he is great and original, must himself create the taste by which he is to be relished. And these two principal figures that I'm talking about today, Constable and Clare, took on that task by determinedly creating and promoting the taste for a new portraiture and poetry of landscape. Their mission was to generate for that landscape a distinctive status and a national affection. And this entailed weaning public taste away from the old dominance of the classical, traditional beau ideal. In this project, they were able to capitalize not only on the Dutch tradition, but also on later developments in picturesque taste. And that's where I want to start. As we saw last time, the first phase of the picturesque 
roughly around the 1770s and 1780s, initiated by William Gilpin, had been concerned with framing the landscape view and prioritizing composition and structure. His popular travel books to the Wye Valley or North Wales or the Lakes were all subtitled relative chiefly to picturesque beauty. No matter where he was going to be, this was going to be a guide that emphasized the appeal of the country on the grounds of picturesque beauty. But in his later work, he was obliged to analyze more rigorously those qualities that distinguish the picturesque from the beautiful. And so picturesque becomes divorced from being an adjective to becoming a noun on its own and increasingly complex. Particularly following Edmund Burke's influential philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas on the beautiful and the sublime of 1759, beauty had been conventionally associated with the properties of smoothness and gentle variation. This didn't satisfy the evolving taste for the picturesque, which was restlessly searching for something more sharply varied. Gilpin realized this, and Gilpin had indeed initiated, helped to initiate it. And so by the 1790s, he was obliged to discuss in a more theoretical way uh, the use of this word that he had popularized. And he began to emphasize the importance of repudiating smoothness in picturesque compositions. This second phase, you see, that's what I'm calling it, the second phase of the picturesque in the 1790s, was less interested in compositional principles and pictorial structure, those Gilpin-esque side screen trees and three distances and so on. And it seized much more on the textural qualities of ruggedness and roughness as essential to the picturesque. To that end, it identified categories of objects that could qualify as intrinsically prime materials for the picturesque. Old cottages, ruined mills and abbeys, ancient oaks, dilapidated gates and fences, beggars and gypsies. It created a new relish for the old, the neglected, the accidental, the obsolete, and the decaying, both in landscape and human subjects. Here, for example, is John Clare lamenting the felling of a much-loved old tree. Old favorite tree, art thou too fled the scene? Could not thy clining age the axe delay? And let thee stretch thy shadows o'er the green, and let thee die in picturesque decay. All those conditions, decay, obsolescence, accident, render objects rough and irregular, almost the opposite of the properties of conventional beauty. As one writer of the 1790s remarked, in the theory of rural scenes, so much is irregularity of parts, a constituent of beauty, that it may very nearly be said that equality is deformity. Equality is deformity. Nothing attracted the attention like neglect, as far as the picturesque taste was concerned. One of the most eloquent proponents of this second phase picturesque was the Herefordshire squire, Sir Uvedale Price. Price was a garden designer, but one whose principles were vehemently opposed to the prevailing capability brown type of landscaping. He detested what he referred to as the Brownian smoothing and leveling the ground. And here is Price in his essay on the picturesque. The moment this mechanical commonplace operation by which Mr. Brown and his followers have gained so much credit is begun, a due to all that the painter admires, to all intricacies, to all the beautiful varieties of form, tint, and light and shade, every deep recess, every bold projection, the fantastic roots of trees, the winding paths of sheep, all must go. In a few hours, the rash hand of false taste completely demolishes 
what time only and a thousand lucky accidents can mature, so as to make it become the admiration and study of a Rysdale or a Gainsborough, and reduces it to such a thing as an oil man in Thames Street may at any time contract for by the yard at Islington or Mile End. Uvedale <laughs> Price's father had been a friend of Gainsborough, hence the invoking of Gainsborough as a standard bearer of the new tastes. Price's essay on the picturesque, to some extent, a deliberate response to Gilpin's three essays, where Gilpin is obliged to start um, working on his uh, ideas about the picturesque. Um, that was uh, in 1792, Gilpin's three essays. Gil uh, Price's essay prioritised accident and intricacy in creating the picturesque. And of these two slides, you've got the improved uh, Brownian landscape at the top and the much more idealised um, picturesque, in picturesque terms, unimproved landscape down at the bottom. It must save gardening costs hugely. <laughs> His essay went on um, to itemise objects that had a more native local British identity. Rutted and sunken lanes, rough banks of wildflowers, stag-headed oaks, shaggy donkeys, decrepit gates, old mossy cottages and ruined water mills. This range of low-life scenery stimulates in the viewer a reaction particularly cherished by Uvedale Price. He calls it visual irritation. It's a condition that doesn't have anything to do with conjunctivitis. It's a property in the objects depicted as well as in the manner of presenting those objects. It's an aesthetic criterion in which sight becomes an extension of touch so that the spectacle of rough textures constitutes an almost haptic stimulus to the eye, a kind of touching stimulus to the eye. As Price remarks, <clears throat> all broken, rugged surfaces have also, by sympathy, something of the same effect on the sight as on the touch. This idea of visual irritation becomes an important property of the picturesque as distinct from the beautiful, which was conventionally associated with smoothness. And remember Price's strictures on Capability Brown's smooth improving of landscapes. Gently varied smoothness in landscape can produce what was often called il riposo di Claudio, Claudian repose. Unrelieved smoothness induces visual monotony. Price illustrates his point by taking two models of woodland landscape, one beautiful and one picturesque. The beautiful woodland scene opens up a grove with smooth and level turf surrounded by flourishing trees free from any tangling undergrowth and a gravel road winding gently through the scene. Demure and slightly dull in his view. The contrasting picturesque version as in this detail from Gainsborough's Cornard Wood, introduces forests with, I quote, wild tangled thickets opening into glades, old stag-headed oaks and twisted beeches, the irregular tracks of wheels and the footpaths of men and animals. And all of this, together with the, quote, intricacy of the objects and the effects of lights and shadows, generates a high degree of activity for the eye to cover in negotiating the visual terrain. From all this, it appears, this is Price now, from all this it appears that as a certain degree of irritation or stimulus is necessary to the picturesque, so on the other hand, a soft and pleasing repose is the effect and the characteristic of the beautiful. Some kind of reconciliation of the irritant stimulus of the picturesque with the calming effect of the beautiful was what Constable confessed he aimed for. And I quote from a letter of August 1824, freshness and sparkle with repose, repose underlined, 
which is my struggle just now. Freshness and sparkle with repose, which is my struggle just now. This idea of irritation suggests affinities between Clare and Constable in the way in which each handles his medium. They have in common a textural sensuousness about their work in poems and paintings. John Clare's language, with its occasional Northamptonshire dialect words, often has a distinctive auditory quality, a densely onomatopoeic roughness and richness of sound in the descriptions of natural scenery. And we could see it as a literary counterpart to the sensuous effects in Constable's handling. To try this out, and you may think this is completely off the wall, I'm going to take some lines from Clare's sonnet, Emmon Sales Heath in Winter, and put them beside a detail from Constable's The Vale of Dedham of 1828. <coughs> I'll read part of Clare's sonnet. I love to see the old heath's withered brake mingle its crimpled leaves with firs and ling, while the old heron from the lonely lake starts slow and flaps his melancholy wing, an oddling crow in idle motion swing on the half-rotten ash tree's topmost twig, beside whose trunk the gypsy makes his bed. Up flies the bouncing woodcock from the brig, where a black quagmire quakes beneath the tread. I wonder if we don't find the journey over this old heath more than just a passage of the mind's eye. I think we subliminally register its sounds and textures too as we respond to the heath's winterscape of dead ferns, tangles of gorse and clumps of old heather in those first two lines. We brush against them, the thickened consonants, the packed syllables, a sibilance, the rough fricatives, all of these clog the movement with a kind of auditory irritation. The phonetic surface has almost a materiality of its own as we absorb this dense natural debris. The foreground of Constable's Dedham Vale gives us much the same scene as Clare describes, a patch of neglected common ground with a tangle of vegetation, rotten tree and gypsy. This section of the landscape is loosely painted in impressionistic dabs and strokes and palette knife touches to convey the confusion of indistinct forms huddled together in wild disarray, nature's prolific accidents, the unimproved landscape. The oil paint seems sometimes thick enough almost to come into bas relief, inviting the touch in its unruly rendering of the vegetation. It's a version of that visual irritation beloved of the picturesque theorists. Constable, in later life, talked about, and I quote, the broken ruggedness of my style. And he underlines those words, the broken ruggedness of my style. Terms which, of course, correspond precisely to the picturesque. He wanted the viewer to respond to its textures and details close up. Some of his paintings were strategically hung in a Paris exhibition on the assumption that they should be seen at a distance. Constable wasn't present in Paris when they were, when they were hung. Uh, they should be seen at a distance, according to the uh, ex exhibitors, thereby resolving some of the roughness of the colors. This was their rationale for hanging it in this way. This was a mistake, said Constable. And he was relieved to hear later that the organizers had acknowledged the richness of the texture and the attention to the surface of objects in these pictures. And that's a quote from uh, Constable, a letter of December 1824. They have, he said at last, acknowledged the richness of the texture and the attention to the surface of objects in these pictures. Constable, like Clare, wanted to reproduce not just the visual record of English landscape, but its broader sensory, affective impact. And he succeeded. His old contemporary, Henry Fuseli, 
said that Constable's Suffolk lanes and breezy, cloud-laden skies made him, quote, call for his greatcoat. Another friend came to Constable's studio to commission a landscape so that he could, quote, feel the wind blowing on his face. A considerable break, this, from the smooth brushwork of a Claude, or indeed the equally smooth rhyming couplets of Clare's 18th century predecessors in poetry. Clare's language draws attention to the phonetic texture almost as much as to the motif. And so with Constable, the surface texture and materiality is part of our landscape experience. Both Clare and Constable respond, as it were, mimetically to the accidental confusion and profusion of natural detail as part of the English scene, where unkempt common land survives alongside the cultivated and the domesticated. This emphasis on picturesque roughness and its favouring certain low-life motifs encourages a new range of subjects for landscape artists and writers and favours English scenery. Here's one writer on the subject, J.T. Smith, in his book Remarks on Rural Scenery, 1797. Palaces, castles, churches, monastic ruins, and the remains, and even vestiges and conjectural situations of our ancient feudal and ecclesiastical structures have been elaborately and indeed very interestingly described with all their characteristic distinctions. While the objects comprehended by the term cottage scenery have by no means been honored with equal attention. And this, it should seem, merely because Though of equal excellence in the scale of picturesque beauty, that beauty happens not to be of the heroic or sublime order. <laughs> Smith is alluding here to the conventional hierarchy of the genres, which elevated to the highest rank of value the genre of history painting with its focus on heroical, historical, religious, or mythological scenes something that uh, Claude managed to do in, in his paintings because in the foreground of these sumptuous, seductive landscapes, there's always some biblical episode or historical or mythological episode. But within this hierarchy, landscape as a genre was some way down the ladder. And then, within that lowly landscape category, cottage scenery which was neither conventionally sublime, nor beautiful, nor associated with heroic moral nobility, would have been near the bottom. So you can see what a formidable task it was to attempt to elevate humble English rural scenery, and this is what Constable was up against. John Smith, the author of those remarks on rural scenery, is our conduit to Constable, on whom I'll now concentrate for a little. Smith was known as Antiquity Smith because he published a very popular book, The Antiquities of London and Its Environs, in 1791. He was an amateur artist, a writer, and latterly keeper of prints at the British Museum. He met the 20-year-old John Constable and his family in 1796, and he briefly mentored the budding painter. Constable helped to raise subscriptions for the publication of Smith's remarks on rural scenery and produced for him some drawings of local Suffolk cottages, some of Constable's earliest drawings. Smith sent prints of Dutch landscape drawings and some of his own copies of these to Constable and encouraged him strongly to copy Rysdale and Vatelo. Vatelo spelt Waterloo. Constable spoke of one of Smith's copies of a Vatelo etching as one of my earliest preceptors. So Constable is being brought up on this uh, Dutch tradition. Smith also asked Constable to undertake some research on his fellow East Anglian, Thomas Gainsborough, who had died in 1788. The young Constable, 
just move that on. The young constable reveled in the remit when touring the countryside near Woodbridge in Suffolk. And he wrote back to Smith with great enthusiasm, I fancy I see Gainsborough in every hedge and hollow tree. The Dutch school models and Gainsborough's paintings didn't monopolize Constable's apprenticeship in landscape. At the same time as he was assiduously copying Reistel and Vatelot, he was able to study and imitate an exquisite small Claude painting owned by the art patron Sir George Beaumont. And this was landscape with Hagar and the Angel, currently in the National Gallery. Constable was very fond of this, and it became a formative influence. For example, in his 1802 painting, Dedham Vale, there on the right. Constable was fully aware of picturesque tastes and with the writers on the picturesque from a young age. In addition to Smith's influence, he had read Gilpin's three essays on the picturesque and Uvedale Price's essay. He knew the repertoire of rough old motifs that the picturesque had made precious, and he shared these tastes. In 1816, he and his wife, Maria, honeymooned in Dorset at Osmington, where there was an old mill. And this he sketched and later made into a painting. The mill burnt down in 1825. And this was very upsetting for Constable. He wrote back to Archdeacon Fisher, who told him about the, uh, uh, the um, end of the poor old mill. I am vexed at the fate of the poor old mill. There will soon be an end of the picturesque in the kingdom. England was improving too rapidly. We can explore this combination of influences in one of his most famous paintings, a classic English scene, The Cornfield of 1826. The composition and motif, I'll come to the actual 1826 one in a minute. The composition of the cornfield and its motif owe much to the Dutch landscape tradition as well as something to Claudian structural principles. Here on the right is Constable's oil sketch of 1817 with a hobbima for comparison. You can see how close they are in style. So Constable takes his motif from the Dutch tradition rutted footpath, rich unkempt vegetation, detailed trees, dramatic sky, and especially in the later finished picture, he adds visual irritation in his handling to suggest, to suggest a freshness and vitality in the brisk breeze and flickering light of play, uh, play of light. <laughs> Nearly a decade later, Constable returns to this 1817 lane sketch to work it up into a finished oil for exhibition, and this becomes the cornfield, 1826. He described the picture as an inland scene, quote, a close lane kind of thing, with the trees shaken by, quote, a pleasant and healthful breeze. Constable, as I said, was conscious of picturesque tastes, and it seems he then deliberately introduced some elements into this painting to satisfy such tastes. As he wrote to a friend, I do hope to sell this present picture, as it has certainly got a little more eye salve than I usually condescend to give to them. <laughs> He's most likely referring to the straggle of fencing in the foreground, the half-dead skeletal tree on the left, compared with the sketch's flourishing tree, the sheep, the old plough, and the broken gate. None of these appear in the earlier sketch. All of them are prime picturesque objects, both as textural features and pastoral elements. And I'm looking more closely at pastoral within this tradition in next week's lecture. But he was also presumably trying to conventionalize this uneventful English landscape, enough to win Academy approval. His hopes of making a sale of this picture and his willingness to add marketable eye salve for that purpose were not fulfilled, extraordinarily. It was never sold in his lifetime. After his death in 1837, it was bought for the National Gallery and has remained there ever since as an icon of English landscape. John Clare 
gave a short list of some of his favorite English scenes in a poem entitled Pleasant Places. And you can see how closely his picturesque tastes correspond with what Constable has provided in the cornfield. Uh, and bear in mind the um, Constable places Dedham Church Tower right there in the center in the background. Here is Clare. Old narrow lanes where trees meet overhead, path styles on which a steeple we espy, peeping and stretching in the distant sky, old ponds dim shadowed with a broken tree. These are the picturesque of taste to me. The lane itself, now Fenbridge Lane near East Burkholt, was one that had special personal significance for Constable. It was the route that he used to take to school when he was a boy. I think, uh, and I'm sidestepping for a, a personal <laughs> um, moment, I think I found the original site of inspiration, a double bend in Fenbridge Lane, at a junction with a smaller path coming in from the right, just hinted at in the painting. The green bank that thrusts out from the left actually cups, it really does cup a small basin for the stream that runs down the side of Fenbridge Lane, an equivalent to the drinking spot for the shepherd boy. The cornfield combines and reconciles the Dutch and the Mediterranean landscape traditions. It harmonizes the freshness and vigor of northern skies and brisk breezes with Claudian pastoral repose, il reposo di Claudio, a life and breezy freshness Constable likes. It also marries Claudian compositional structures with the rough textures cherished by picturesque fashion. It also naturalizes those combined imported traditions as it applies them to unspectacular English scenery. It is an unspectacular scene, but emotionally precious to the painter. A part of the cornfield's raison d'etre, as with so many of Constable's great paintings, is the strong personal sentimental associations that the painter has with this specific English location. This passionate local attachment, this deeply personal rationale for choice of motif is, as I suggest, something quite new. Constable's art of local attachment is part and parcel of his persistent promotion of the status of landscape painting. Central to this is his publication of a series of printed plates entitled Various Subjects of Landscape Characteristic of English Scenery, and these were published over the years 1830 to 1833. It was a series of mezzotints based on his own paintings, and it gives him the opportunity to add text to his paintings of personally important places. The aim is spelt out as follows in Constable's preface. To increase the interest for and promote the study of the rural scenery of England, with all its endearing associations, its amenities, and even in its simple localities. The author may be pardoned for introducing a spot to which he must naturally feel so much attached. And though to others it may be void of interest or any associations, to him it is fraught with every endearing recollection. In order to promote the status of English home scenery, this project will include the most simple localities. The simplest localities and the most banal scenery, beautified anyway by the passion of personal attachment, can be rendered formally beautiful by the kind of pictorial treatment Constable is developing. It doesn't matter that it's not classically beautiful, not the beau ideal. Constable famously remarked, I never saw an ugly thing in my life. For let the form of an object be what it may, light and shade and perspective will always make it beautiful. John Clare might have echoed these sentiments, word for word. He understood the sanctity of common things, especially when light and shade worked their magic and made the ordinary into the extraordinary. I take one example 
in one of his sonnets, Wood Pictures in Spring, where he seems to challenge the painter to render the distinctive beauty of mundane objects clad in natural sunshine. The rich brown umber hue the oaks unfold when spring's young sunshine bathes their trunks in gold, so rich, so beautiful, so past the power of words to paint, my heart aches for the dower the pencil gives to soften and infuse this brown luxuriance of unfolding hues. This living, luscious tinting woodlands give into a landscape that might breathe and live. And this old gate that claps against the tree, the entrance of spring's paradise should be. Yet paint itself with living nature fails. The sunshine threading through these broken rails in mellow shades, no pencil air conveys, and mind alone feels fancies and portrays. In this exquisite poem, the simplest local objects, a woodland of oaks in spring with an old gate, are doubly glorified, infused both with a golden umber radiance and with a passionate feeling projected by the poet. And the scene is transformed into paradise, this common scene. It responds to Wordsworth's rhetorical question in his preface to the excursion, 1814. I read, paradise and groves, Elysian, fortunate fields like those of old sought in the Atlantic main, why should they be a history only of departed things or a mere fiction of what never was? For the discerning intellect of man, when wedded to this goodly universe in love and holy passion, shall find these a simple produce of the common day. Elysium is here and now. Back to Constable's publication, English Landscape Scenery. The first of the plates to be issued was a real challenge. It was indeed one of the most simple localities, hardly arresting at all in its own right, a portrait of Constable's birthplace and childhood home, and the picture includes the figure of a sketching artist. In a way, this is chapter one of Constable's autobiography. This candid declaration of personal motives is, I think, as I said, something quite new, and hence Constable's slightly apologetic tone. As this work was begun and pursued by the author solely with a view to his own feelings as well as his own notions of art, he may be pardoned for introducing a spot to which he must naturally feel so much attached. And though to others it may be void of interest or any associations, to him it is fraught with every endearing recollection. That and the sequence of landscapes that followed in the series of prints all had very personal meaning. Constable uses the word associations several times in that preface. It's a word that acquired some resonance in this period, and I'd like to say a little bit about it. If we accept the premise that the human mind at birth is a tabula rasa, blank slate, as propounded by the philosopher John Locke in 1690, a blank slate ready to be inscribed by the sensory and intellectual experiences of early life, then it follows that each individual grows up as the product of sen different sense data absorbed from accumulated experiences. According to association psychology, these sensations and ideas are then gradually processed and stored as associative clusters. So, as Coleridge said, ideas by having been together acquire a power of recalling each other or every partial representation awakes the total representation of which it had been a part. So we and our individual tastes are the sum of our associated experiences. <coughs> by the early 1790s, just around the time that the picturesque was being earnestly debated, popularized ideas about associationism and local attachment were being taken up by writers and artists. And I put up some of the, the key uh, publications there. This is a passage from Rogers, Samuel Rogers' Pleasures of Memory, the preface, just as a succinct summary. When ideas have any relation whatever, they are attractive of each other in the mind, and the perception of any object naturally leads to the idea of another which was connected with it. Hence arises our attachment to inanimate objects, 
Hence also, in some degree, the love of our country. You can see how this now adds encouragement to writers and artists to focus more on the local and the native, on those environments charged with personal significance. This passage from Allison is something that Constable uh, read and responded to strongly. The scenes which have been distinguished by the residents of any person whose memory we may admire produce a similar effect. The scenes themselves may be little beautiful, but the delight with which we recollect the traces of their lives blends itself insensibly with the emotions which the scenery itself excites. And the admiration which these recollections afford seems to give a kind of sanctity to the place where they dwelt and converts everything into beauty which appears to have been connected with them. And compare this with Constable's sentiments about the power of association for him. The sound of water escaping from mill dams, willows, rotten banks, slimy posts and brickwork. I love such things. As long as I do paint, I shall never cease to paint such places. They have always been my delight. I should paint my own places best. Painting is but another word for feeling. I associate my careless boyhood to all that lies on the banks of the star. They made me a painter and I am grateful. Association theory proves a powerful force in challenging the idea of an absolute standard of beauty. Associationism, in effect, helps to democratize taste and vindicates the relativist subjective position in aesthetics. If cottage scenery or English country lanes are emotionally precious through their deep associations with childhood, then that justifies fulsome artistic and poetic attention. The ordinary person and his or her tastes become culturally empowered. Their individual sense of what is beauty has an authority, whether or not that beauty conforms to academic aesthetics. There's no need for deference to the aesthetics of a cultural elite, such as the Royal Academy. Constable, disappointed again and again in his attempts to be accepted into the Academy, once wrote sourly of, quote, all those members who stickle for the elevated and noble walks of art, i.e., preferring the shaggy posteriors of a satyr to the moral feeling of landscape. The importance of the moral feeling for landscape and local attachment through association, the bonding to individual familiar places, regardless of their supposed beauty or ugliness, grows out of this new interest in the validity of private and personal experience. And all of these values are crucial to the life and work of John Clare. And here I'm putting Claire up beside Constable in terms of the recognition that they were both countrymen and they were deeply sceptical about uh, the city's attitudes towards the country. The Londoners, with all their ingenuity as artists, know nothing of the feelings of country life, says Constable, the essence of landscape. And Claire, what appears as beauties in the eyes of a pent-up citizen are looked upon as conceits by those who live in the country. And even of Keats, as is the case with other inhabitants of great cities, he, Keats, often described nature as she appeared to his fancies, and not as he would have described her had he witnessed the things he describes. John Clare's intense devotion to the local, the native, the personal, and the neglected in English landscape is extraordinary. Clare asserts again and again what he considers beautiful in rural scenery. It's an idiosyncratic repertoire of motifs, as we saw in those lines from Emmon Sale's Heath in Winter, and it constitutes a very deliberate challenge to the stale imagery of traditional pastoral with its imports from Greek or Roman mythology. <coughs> Here's Claire writing, pastoral poems are full of nothing but the old threadbare epithets of sweet singing cuckoo, lovelorn nightingale, fond turtles, sparkling brooks, these make up the creation of pastoral and descriptive poesy, and everything else is reckoned low and vulgar. In fact, they are too rustic for the fashionable or prevailing system of rhyme. And that mention of what is reckoned low and vulgar takes us back to the tyranny of that hierarchy of genres. Claire was marketed, as you can see, um, 
maybe, just here, was marketed as a Northamptonshire peasant. He had a passion for poetry and a profound feeling for the identity of specific places and of his roots in those places. In fact, this feeling for local attachment, for all these life-building associations, was so acute that the separation from his own home and environment may well have contributed to his mental breakdown in his early 40s. I'll give one example. This is from Shadows of Taste. Associations sweet each object breeds. The man of true taste loves each desolate neglected spot that seems in labor's hurry left forgot. The crank and punished trunk of stunted oak, freed from its bonds but by the thunder stroke, as cramped by struggling ribs of ivy sear, there the glad bird makes home for half the year. But take these several beings from their homes, each beauteous thing a withered thought becomes. Association fades, and like a dream, they are but shadows of the things they seem. Torn from their homes and happiness, they stand the poor, dull captives of a foreign land. The passage is dominated by the emotional drama of separation, and note how crucial this issue of association becomes. Claire loves each desolate, neglected spot that seems in labor's hurry left forgot. This fondness for neglected spots is something he shared with Constable and indeed with the picturesque theorists. Constable had written, my limited and abstracted art is to be found under every hedge and in every lane, and therefore nobody thinks it worth picking up. These neglected spots correspond to the prime picturesque motifs that I've mentioned. But one can also think of the elevation of the neglected, their great mission, as a corollary to the artistic neglect of English scenery in the conventional tradition of landscape painting. Nobody thinks it worth picking up. That is, until these later picturesque theorists and tourists, and then Constable and Clare come along. Claire didn't know Constable, but he was devoted to particular painters who, as far as he was concerned, represented essentially the unassuming landscape character of his own environment. One of these was Peter de Wint. Claire wrote to him once, asking for, I quote, one of those rough sketches taken in the fields that breathes with the living freshness of open air and sunshine, sounding very like Constable's ambitions for the cornfield. Constable's paintings deployed all the means that he had to take people into the open air so that they could experience, I quote, my breezes, my bloom and my freshness, no one of which qualities has yet been perfected on the canvas of any painter in this world. Some of de Wint's paintings Claire described as facsimiles of English scenery, and English is underlined, facsimiles of English scenery, a little later, he wrote a sonnet to De Wint, and it's an appropriate text to conclude with. In the sonnet, when he mentions pencil, he's referring actually to paintbrush. Pencil is the old-fashioned term for paintbrush. De Wint, I would not flatter, nor would I pretend to critic skill in this thy art. Yet in thy landscapes, I can well descry the breathing hues as nature's counterpart. No painted peaks, no wild romantic sky, no rocks nor mountains as the rich sublime hath made thee famous, but the sunny truth of nature that doth mark thee for all time found on our level pastures. Spots forsooth where common skill sees nothing deemed divine. Yet here a worshipper was found in thee, and thy young pencil worked such rich surprise that rushy flats, befringed with willow tree, rival the beauties of Italian skies. That sonnet encapsulates so much of what I've been tracing in this lecture and last week's. You can hear loud and clear that nationalistic note, compelling emancipation from the tyranny of foreign models of landscape beauty. Claire dislikes what he sees as the artifice and the rhetorical flourishes in Claude and Salvatore Rosa and their British followers. It's as if their landscapes were painted stage sets. 
Those painters also worked in an idiom that allowed no attention to the texture and detail and character of English landscape. Like Constable in painting, Clare's mission in his poetry was to rehabilitate and reinvigorate pastoral imagery for the English tradition as part and parcel of the project to raise the prestige of native English scenery. Constable wrote, I hold the genuine pastoral feel of landscape to be very rare and difficult of attainment, and by far the most lovely department of painting as well as of poetry. Next week, we look at a painter of the English landscape, Samuel Palmer, who in many respects resists the naturalism of Constable and Clare, but who adds something utterly distinctive to the personality of English pastoral scenery. Thank you.